everybody. Would you turn to number 342? 342, he included me. So glad you came with us. Stand with us, please, to 342. 342, he included me. I am so happy in Christ today. I am so happy in Christ today that I go see. This morning, excited to see what the Lord's going to do today. Let's start off in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the crowd that's here this morning. Lord, we ask that everything that happens here today may bring honor and glory and praise to your name. Lord, you be with our with the singing and the fellowshipping. Lord, would you put a special touch upon preacher as he preaches this morning? We need to hear from you. We thank you for it in your son's name. Amen. Thank you. you can be seated. All right, number 38, 38. How great thou art. We'll sing it on all four verses. Drop out on the third verse. We'll show you.
praise the Lord. We're so glad you're here this morning. Visitors, we're thankful, thankful that you're here this morning. And if you've not received a visitor card, our men would love to give you one. And we'll not embarrass you, but if you just raise your hand, we'll give you a visitor card. So you can turn that in at the end. We have a visitor over here, Brother Tim. Uh, very good. Anybody else oh, over here also? Very good. All right. Anybody else this morning has not received a visitor card yet? No. If you'll just take that and fill it out. And at the end of the service, my right and your left in the lobby there, uh, we'll, um, we'll give you a, um, a uh, coffee mug. And um, I felt weak today. And we'll give you a coffee mug. That way you can think of us. And uh, you're our honored guest this morning. We're so glad you're here. The choir will sing. <laughs>
because the words of it I think are very important at this time. You know, today's October 31st, and, and uh, I guess it's Halloween, right? I see some of you wore your masks in the church this morning. We'd prefer you not to do that. Wait till later. But uh, I always laugh about this time of year because Christians get in this big old fuss and fight over this day. Let me just say that this holiday, or whatever you want to call it, does not threaten our God. And if we think it does, then we got a puny God. I love what Brother John said to start Sunday school this morning. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And if anything, it's my nephew's birthday, so that's more important to me than, uh, than Halloween. So here's the deal, church. I know we live in a weird time. You know, gas prices are going up. People are nervous. It's, the economy's unstable. And we have a man in the White House that can't complete full sentences, and we need to pray for him, seriously. And I mean that. We really need to pray for him. He needs, he's, he's, uh, it's just sad what's going on in our country. Our leadership is letting us down. But remember, in the end, it's over. We win. We win. We win. The Lord Jesus Christ has made it possible. He has finished his task. We are on the winning side. Our God is victorious, and nothing catches him by surprise. Our God is so big, a little puny holiday like this does not threaten our God. And that's why we're going to have trunk or treat. We're going to take this day and turn it into something to reach people for the cause of Christ. So church, listen today. We are on the winning side, and not because of anything we've done, but because we have an excellent coach who's been there, done that, and won the championship for us all. He defeated sin. He defeated hell. He defeated death. And most of all, he defeated the devil himself on the resurrection morning. So today I'm preaching briefly on the subject of the word hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. It's only in the Bible over 20 times, only two times in the New Testament. But, boy, we need to talk about how holy our God is again. And, hey, we are on the winning side. So, choir, sing that again. Listen to the words. And let's realize that the more we listen to songs like this, and less we listen to Fox News even and the news media, the more we'll realize that, hey, on the other side, everything's aight. Yeah. Come on. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Christ is King, for he conquered death once for all. We will live in light of his victory, following his gospel call. And when the story ends, we know Jesus wins, for his power cannot be stopped. Nothing ever can, nothing ever Please turn to number 20, number 20 in your hymns. Praise him, praise him. All right. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed redeemer. Sing, oh, earth is wonderful to proclaim. Hail him, hail him. Highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor. Give to his holy name. Like a shepherd. Children in his arms, he 
Second verse. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song on the last. singing today, great singing today. We know today's an adjusted schedule. Let's take our Bibles. You may be seated. Turn to Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11. <clears throat> Afterwards this morning, I know we have some visitors here. Always honored to have visitors. Thank you so much for being here. And I got a cartwheel request during handshaking time, so stay tuned. I'll do that for the Jesus and for those uh, people that would like to see that. But uh, more importantly today, I really want you to listen as we Look at a very important subject today uh, here in the Bible. But we have lunch right afterwards, and we are welcoming and inviting all of you to stay. Please feel free to stick around. We usually have plenty of food. After church today, kids, if you're sixth grade and younger, please stay with your parents. Go in line. We know children are famous for taking eight meatballs when they should probably only take two. We say, why'd you say meatballs? Because my wife made those, and those are my favorite thing on the table today. And uh, so, and then also kids, uh, this is an exciting announcement. We now have a chair lift on this hallway over here that goes down. And uh, for those of you that have a hard time with stairs, uh, the $3 a ride, all right? <laughs> it's $3 to get down, $2 to get back up. We do have to pay for it, so no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we have a chair lift, so you're able to go down and up. Uh, kids, stay away from it, do not touch it. And in fact, kids don't even go down the steps. Teenagers don't even go down the steps. And if you teenagers get on the chair lift, Brother Bussy and I will give you a reason to need it next time, so. <laughs> All right, so make sure we stay off the chair lifts uh, unless you really need them. But we thank the Lord for that, Brother Bus, took care of that and got that all taken care of. And so that'll be a blessing today. And then we have an afternoon service at 1.30. Pastor Bus, you'll be preaching in that service. And then we'll have a break. And if you're part of Trunk or Treat, that starts back up at 5 o'clock this evening. And pray for that if you're not involved, because last year we had 500 kids come through Trunk or Treat. And so we have an opportunity to minister to our community today, and we're excited about that. So let's look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. One of the things I do love about the Bible we use here is there's certain English words that, that have kind of dropped out of our English language. We don't use them as much as we used to, but they're beautiful words. They're words that had real powerful meanings. One of the phrases Brother George talks to me a lot about, we've discussed through the years, is the difference between shall and will. In the olden days, they used shall a lot more than they did will. Shall has a more powerful meaning than will does. And uh, there's words in the old English Bible, and just sometimes you listen to, even my wife and I listen to the, my, our Bohemian friends speak. They speak that old English, and they actually, we've dumbed down our language, and um, they, they sometimes make us sound, I mean, they, they're very articulate, aren't they, babe? Just the way they speak. And you'll see words like that in this old King James Bible. They'll just pop off at the page. And one of them only shows up a little over 20 times in your Bible, and that's the word hallow or hallowed. Today is Halloween, and we take for granted the fact that that word is in that so-called holiday, whatever you want to call it. But look at Matthew 6. The Lord's Prayer is what it's called. It really is a model prayer for us. In verse 8, it says, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, you see, this is an example. Therefore pray ye. Now, we have a faith. We always we talk a lot about thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts and we forgive our debtors. All that stuff's great. Doctrinal stuff. Applications can be made on prayer, outlines, and so on. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. But he starts the prayer off by saying this. Our Father, which art in heaven, 
Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Wow. Go to Luke chapter 11. The only other time it's in the New Testament. Like I said, it's about 19 or 20 times in the Old Testament. And only two times in the New Testament. And both times they are spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 11, and we'll be in this portion of scripture for the rest of the message. The message will not be long tonight or today. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass that he was praying in a certain place when he ceased. One of his disciples said unto the Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. All right, fine. We'll teach you how to pray. And here's, here's again, you'll see him saying things like, give us day by day our daily bread in verse 3. But in verse 2, look at this. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, our Father which art in heaven. Here it is. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Wow, we need a revival of realizing the hallow of God, the holiness of God. And maybe that challenges today. This time we're here, especially if you're the message. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Hello. I'm just going to read you two scriptures real quick to kind of go with this song. Um, both are just Jesus talking to you. <clears throat> the first we know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then, John 13, 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Every preacher in the pulpit, every cynic on the street, every poet, every pauper, every traitor, every thief, every soldier, every lawyer, every TV talk show star, anybody teaching students, anybody tending bar, God so loved the world. God so loved the world. Every judge and every jailer, every master, every slave, every rebel, every skeptic, every addict in their chains, all the powerful and pretty, all the faithful and the fools, those bowing down to idols, those seeking to find truth. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. Every daughter, every son, all of us, the fallen ones. God so loved the world. Loves. Let us love, let us love, let us love anyone that he loves. Let us love, let us love every preacher in the pulpit, every cynic on the street, even you and me. God so loved the world, God so loved the world, every daughter, every son, all of us, the fallen ones, God so loved the world, God so loved the world. Woo! Good song. And that song is perfect for this message today because of what the message is all about. Praise the Lord for that. The word hallowed, it can be meaning the word holy or holiness. There's sanctification. And it's a beautiful word. And I don't have time to get into all the history of how we got to this point of Halloween. I think it's, I will say this, unashamed, I think it's a tragedy that is the second most spent money on hol holiday of the year, only second to Christmas. I think that's ridiculous. It, it, it boggles my mind that we, we, we're so in tune with Halloween that that's, 
that it's made that stat. I, that, that shocks me as an American. I just, I'm just going to say that for free. I won't charge you for that one. That's for free. But in, in history, there, this, this day, October 31st, was a day before All Saints Day. And All Saints Day was a day where they honored saints of old. And a lot of that is religious and mysticism and all that. But today I want us to look at the word hallow. Hallow. Let me start off by saying I'm not worthy to even preach this truth today. Because I'm not worthy to be called hallowed. There is nothing hallow about me except by the blood of Jesus Christ and him alone. My salvation has made me hallow in his eyes. The gift of his blood, Hebrews, amen, Brother John, has made me pure in his eyes. I deserve a place called hell. I am a sinner who, thank God, received his gift of love. But today in America, we are conforming God into something that he is not. We have redefined his attributes that make him who he is. I want you to notice something very interesting about the phrase holy in the Bible. Now, the word holy and holiness appears more times in the Bible. But if you'll notice in Isaiah chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 4, in those two chapters, there is there's a demonstration of what you would see at the throne where God sits. And where God sits, there is an echoing declaration made by, and each chapter represents two different entities. One is the seraphims in Isaiah chapter 6, and in Revelation chapter 4, they're called the beasts. And those groups of entities are screaming, crying out all the time, holy, holy, holy. We live in a world now where holiness has been removed from our daily vocabulary. The line of that which is right and holy has been moved so far that what we consider clean today would have been considered filthy 50 years ago. And Christians have embraced this God is so loving concept. And don't miss this now. We're going to get to that in a second. It's going to be real good. This God is so loving concept that we have robbed him, robbed him of his desire to still demonstrate holiness. You understand today that heaven, heaven is the only place in this universe that has absolutely zero sin or zero unholiness. Heaven is a perfectly holy place, which then shows me that because of my unholiness, I am hopeless without him. As you study the phrases of holiness and and the doctrine of holiness through the Bible, you will find that God makes a big deal of it. Why do they say it three times? That's interesting, too. Maybe once for God the Father, once for God the Son, and once for God the Holy Spirit. Reminding all of us, the echo of all eternity, that God is a holy God. And God hates sin. And God hates unrighteousness. But thank God he looks past that because he loves the sinner. Now let's break this down a little bit and see why Jesus would say, as you open the prayer, hey, here we go. Our Father, which art in heaven, that's who we're addressing, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. That's the first title. Jesus is reminding us that as we get ready to pray, as we get ready to pour our heart out to God, as we get ready to list our petitions to him, we better understand and remember that he is a holy God and we should be stunned, humbled, shocked, grateful, just almost in awe that we get to speak to such a holy God today. God is holy. Hey, church, God is holy. In fact, right now you can almost hear it in heaven. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 echoes out over and over. Watch this, church. They don't say love, love, love. They don't say mercy, mercy, mercy. Oh, get ready for this one. They don't say grace, grace, grace. They don't. But watch this now. Because of his holiness, we now are the beneficiaries of love, mercy, and grace. Why is that? Number one, statement number one. Don't miss this now. Holiness demands... Justice, but provides mercy. Let me say it again. Holiness demands justice, but provides mercy. <laughs> Through my years, I've been a certified licensed interpreter, and one of my favorite things to do is interpret in court. And I still go to court pretty regularly, uh, yet you have the higher level certified interpreters to do that. And I love court because it's usually quick and short, and 
I've been able to meet with a lot of judges, and it's been a great experience through the years. It's always interesting to see the different judges I've worked with through the years as an interpreter. Some judges are very by the book. They don't even look at the person. They don't hear their story. They don't hear their testimony. They just see the law that they broke. They see what the book calls for, and they execute judgment. End of story. Some, on the other hand, will sometimes demonstrate a little bit of mercy, a little bit of grace. They will hear their story. They will hear their background, and they'll allow them maybe a little bit of mercy, a little bit of grace, because here's the deal, church. The law demands justice, and when the law has been broken, there has to be payment for that justice. It's, it's just the way it is. I understand every time I take the chance and run a red light, I could have to pay for that. There's times I've gone away with it. I don't do it often. I just did it three times yesterday. That's it. I don't do it often, okay? <laughs> but if you decide to go one mile power over the speed limit, the law says you're supposed to go 70, so if you go 71, you're taking a chance. That's the law, right? We understand that. All of us have that concept. We understand that you're not supposed to rob a bank. If you do, you might get away with it for a while, but if you get caught, there will be punishment for the breaking of that law. All of that is good. Can I tell you something today? I thank God for good laws. I'm glad we live in a country that has the law of the land. And by the way, that came from here. When God instituted Israel, he established what we call the Ten Commandments. And by the way, church, if our country would get back to the Ten Commandments, we'd be a lot better country today. Maybe the Ten Commandments should hang in our public schools. I mean, it's still on display in our capital property right now in the backyard. Go look at the Capitol. There's a display of the Ten Commandments. So church today, the challenge is this, to recognize, to understand, to begin to say, wow, God is holy. So watch this. As God looks down in his holiness as a judge, as the king of kings, as the Lord of lords, he saw me, Randy Dignan, and said, he is a sinner. He's broken my law. When I see him, I see unholiness. But because God is so perfect, and all those judges I've interpreted for are not perfect, in his perfection, God desires to share that perfection with that which is not perfect. God desires to allow us another opportunity. Wait a minute. He should not. He gave us a perfect place. Adam and Eve had everything. No sin, no temptations, no wicked. I mean, everything was there in the garden. It was a beautiful place. They walked with God every day. And all of a sudden, a serpent shows up one day, and everything's changed. And now we see the price of sin. I've seen it so fresh in the last few weeks with problems and situations and, and the messes that sin gets us into. But God looks down from heaven, and because of his holiness, he is driven by love. Because of his holiness, he wants to give us mercy because of his holiness he desires the sharing of grace you see church today we should really be afraid and grateful at the same time for God's holiness and Jesus is teaching us to pray and he's saying do you understand that the holiest being in all the universe is interested enough in you that he will look past our unholiness and forgive us of our sin and grant unto us the gift of mercy, which is not getting what we deserve, and grace, which is getting what we don't deserve, and love, which is just inexplicable, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God, where he hears the phrase all the time, holy, 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 devised a plan that a son might come and be the holiest man on this earth and die on the cross and become sin for you and me so that God could look down at Randy now and say, I see my son instead of Randy's sin. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. And today God has been mocked. Today's name's been drugged through the mud. And I've been guilty of that. God, forgive me. I deserve to die pretty much for some of the things I've done in my life. We're all sinners. We've fallen short. And Satan loves to accuse us of that. Why? Because Satan knows the significance of his holiness. Because he understood what it was like to break the holiness of God. God's holiness is not going to be compromised anytime soon. God is holy today. But because of that, it demands justice. And because of that, he grants us mercy. Thank God John 3.16 is the beautiful 
Brother Josh singing it, it's, it's the culmination of holiness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoso believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. In that same context, it says that we are now no longer condemned. Why were we condemned? Because we were unholy. Why are we not condemned? Because of him, we are holy now. Wow, what a God. Number two, real quickly. Number one, holiness demands justice, but provides mercy. Perfection is the goal. God has a desire to make that which is imperfect, perfect again. Number two, holiness is the goal. Holiness is a goal. Can I ask you a question today? As a Christian today, what is your goal? What is my goal? What, are, what, are, what should our goals be as Christians today? Have you thought about that? What's our goals? Well, people say this a lot of times, right? I want to get closer to God. How many have heard that before? Raise your hand. I want to be more like Jesus. How many? Raise your hand. All right, how, how about this? I want to win more souls to Christ. Raise your hand, right? Wonderful. You know what's necessary for those three things? An old-fashioned dose of holiness. <laughs> holiness is a difference maker. Isn't it interesting? Do you understand that the first time the word holy shows up in the Bible is in Exodus chapter 3? And you know what God describes in that chapter? Ground. He tells Moses, hey, Moses, take off your shoes for the ground you're standing on. Now, that's holy ground. Holy ground. The ground was not holy because the dirt that made it up was holy or because the bush that was there made it holy or because the sun shining on it made it holy. The ground was holy because God showed up there. And God's presence brings with it holiness. So holiness or being hallowed is a goal. In Isaiah chapter 5, you have the story of Isaiah. He's writing the book of Isaiah and in the last part of, in the beginning part, or the last part of chapter 5, you'll see how Isaiah is rebuking Israel. He uses the phrase, woe, which is a scolding. In, in the sign language, you, it's a scolding. It's woe. Woe unto you. Six times he says woe. And before, in the early part of the chapter, God expresses his disappointment in Israel. He says, I have put a hedge about you. And, and Israel, I expected a, a certain kind of fruit. What is God saying? A fruit that comes from a holy nation. A fruit that comes from a nation that pleases God. A fruit that comes from marriages that please God or homes that please God. I expected that fruit of you. And God is an investor. He expects ROI, a return on his investment. And God says, I am holy because you have forfeited that right. I've taken down the hedge. God wasn't even judging Israel yet. And all of a sudden the enemy came in and Israel got what it wanted. Hence, America's getting what it wants now. But don't miss this now. It gets good. So Isaiah says, whoa, six times. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You can read the chapter later if you like. But in chapter 6, Isaiah gets a glimpse of God's holiness. And when he sees God sitting on his throne, he sees the temple being filled with smoke. He sees the post shaking. He sees God and his train filling up the temple, his train, like his, his, whole, his whole aura about him. And Isaiah can't even look upon him. <coughs> Isaiah is like stunned to be in his presence. And he sees the seraphims with six wings, with twain they covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. And by the way, we shouldn't be spooked out by this. We watch some crazy stuff on Hollywood all the time. Come on, somebody say amen right there. But this is a true picture. And he sees the, the, the seraphims hovering about God with six wings, with twain they cover the face, with twain they cover the feet, and with twain they didn't fly, the Bible says. And they cry out, holy, holy, holy. And the same Isaiah who was saying, woe to that crowd, said these three words, woe is me. Woe is me. And the Bible goes on and says in that same chapter, Isaiah chapter 6, that Isaiah then has his lips purged from iniquity. And I had a preacher say one time that 70% of our sins come from right here. And I, I began to study that out. First time I heard a preacher say it, I was like, ah, I don't know about that. And as I studied it out, I found out, wow, this guy here gives me a lot of trouble. And death felt this right here. And Facebook and social media. I mean, we, we put things out there that are constantly stirring the pot and the world looks at us and wonders why would I want what you guys have right <laughs> we're critical we're negative 
And Isaiah sees God and he hears the seraphims. What are you going to say about God? I mean, isn't God loving? Oh, he is. Isn't God merciful? Oh, he's merciful. Isn't God gracious? Oh, yes, he's gracious. What are you going to say to him? You're in the presence of God. What echoes out throughout eternity? What are you going to use to describe our God? It's very simple. Listen, hey, hey, take, get, your, get your paper and pen out right now and write three points. It's one, two, three, three points. Here it goes. Ready? Holy, holy, holy. He is a holy God today and he's interested in unholy people. Wow! Wow! Holiness is a goal. It's amazing what we've allowed us to listen to today and to watch and to converse about. It's amazing how we've allowed Christianity to become so watered down now that the word holiness is a foreign word to us now. The word hallow is a foreign word to us. Number one, I'm almost sure holiness Demands justice and provides mercy. Number two, holiness is a goal. Number three, and I'm done. Holiness is the difference maker. Holiness is the difference maker. <laughs> how do you become holy? Have you ever thought about that? How? How am I supposed to be holy? I mean, I, I'm sin. Since I've been up this morning, I've sinned. I probably sinned in my dreams last night. I sinned yesterday. I sin every time I drive on I-70. Yeah. Always. Especially when I'm driving the left lane, I sin more in the left lane than I do the right lane. Always sin when I'm driving. I sin constantly. It's there. It stares me in the face. It, 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 sometimes it wants to almost crush me. I get discouraged by my failures. So how? How can God, how can he do that? Notice this, notice this, notice this. Notice this truth. I saw this. I got fired up. Look at verse 2 again of, of Luke chapter 11. You ready? Here's what the Bible says. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, our Father which art in heaven. That explains where God is. Hallowed be thy person. It didn't say that. Wait a minute now. Let's read that again. Hallowed be thy being. Hallowed be thy presence. And by the way, all three of those would be appropriate. Hallowed be thy trinity. No. What does it say, church? Hallowed be thy what? Name. Name. Don't miss this now. My son is here in the front row. And he bears our name. Because he bears our name, he gets to live in my house and eat my food and sleep in my bed. Well, not the bed I sleep in, but it's, I own the bed. That would be awkward. But he sleeps in the bed I bought. And he, he just signed, thank you. I appreciate that, buddy. I'm glad you're appreciative. But because he has my name, don't miss this now, he gets to experience the blessings and benefits that I've given to him because he bears my name. <laughs> Some of you following me now? When we get saved by the grace of God, it's a long process to become like him. In fact, we will never achieve that goal until we get to heaven. But we've got to strive and strive and strive and get rid of sins and let the Holy Spirit change us. But as soon, as soon as you get saved, you immediately bear his name. Okay, that's what's called. Woo, hallelujah, praise the Lord, hallelujah. There it is. I did not have to earn his name. I did not have to earn his title. As soon as I got saved, I became a child of God. I'm in his family. I bear his name. And because of that, I can access the holy things of God. It doesn't say, hallowed be thy person. It says, hallowed be thy name. Which means I can tell you today, I, because of salvation, am a child of God. And because of his son, who literally, let's, let's just do doctrinally, biblically, is my big brother. Because of my father and my big brother, I can stand in a spirit of humility and gratefulness 
understanding that I have complete access to the throne of a hallowed God. There's one word for that. Wow. Wow. Hallowed be thy name. Head your bad eyes are closed. Thank you for listening so well. Hello, Pastor Randy Dingman here of Bible Baptist Church, Jefferson City, Missouri. I'm going to take a moment and express to you what our main vision and purpose is of this ministry. You see, much of this world today has a question. It's a question that was asked in John chapter 3 by one person. It's a question that is asked by the masses, but when you really think about it, it's really a question we all have to come to grips with, face to face with, one on one in our lives, sometime in our life. The question is this, where will I spend eternity? And that question was asked by a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He approached Jesus Christ in the middle of the night and had a question about spiritual matters. Well, good thing for Nicodemus, he came to the right person at the right time because Jesus Christ is the answer in spiritual matters. You see, many of us have questions about that, and man has tried in many of its efforts to answer that question with their own ideas and philosophies. We've tried to come up with ideas on how to get us to heaven, how to confirm our way to heaven. But the fact is we've got to find out what God says about eternal things. And that's why asking Jesus Christ that question is so vital. Because when you ask Jesus a question, you get the answer. And as the question was asked, Jesus answered simply this. You must be born again. In John chapter 3, that's what he said to Nicodemus. And that's the same thing he says to you and to me even today. You see, God is God of this universe, but he's not everybody's father. What does that have to do with John chapter 3? Well, think about this. We all have birthdays. We all are physically born under this physical planet. Or else you wouldn't be able to watch me or I wouldn't be able to sign to you right now or talk to you at this time. But God, being a spiritual being, knew that though our bodies are temporal, our spiritual part of us, our spiritual anatomy of us, is an eternal thing. And so God says, I'm more concerned about the spiritual issues. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and me 2,000 years ago and live again three days later so that you and I can have a spiritual birthday and know for sure that heaven is our home. Well, that leads to the next question. Why do we need a spiritual birthday? Well, it's simple. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law and God's commands. But God loves us so much so that he let Jesus Christ become the substitute for your sin and my sin. So that if we recognize and admit that we are sinners, we can then trust in Jesus Christ as our substitute. And more so than that, our personal Savior and know that on top of our physical birthdays, we have a spiritual birthday now in that God becomes our father, we become his sons, daughters, we become his children, and we know we're going to go to heaven someday. My friend, it's very simple. It's not about what the church says, what I have ideas about, or what you have ideas about. It's finding out what God says directly to you and me. And he did it right there in the Bible, and in particular, John chapter 3, when Jesus says, you must be born again. If our church can help you with that question, if you have any questions about that, we can give you some answers. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Again, Pastor Randy, personally thanking you for watching the message. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. God bless and make it a great day.